All right, welcome back. Let's start with this example. We have find two positive numbers whose product is 108 and the sum of the first number plus three times the second number is a minimum. All right, so what we know here is that we're going to be looking for two different values, two positive numbers who have the product of 108. So for our first equation that we're gonna write down here, we know that the product of two numbers, let's say X and Y, is going to be equal to 108. And so what else do we know about these two numbers? Well, we know that the sum of the first number plus three times the second number is a minimum. And so we'll make X our first number and Y our second number. And so what this means is that the sum, and I'm gonna represent that with an S, will be equal to that first number X plus three times the second number, which is y, right? That's what this says right here. The sum of the first number plus three times the second number is a minimum. And so what we're going to try to do here is try to find the values of x and y such that this sum is a minimum. And so that means that this equation right here is going to be our primary equation. We are going to be taking the derivative of this equation because we're trying to minimize the sum. Whichever equation deals with the quantity that you're trying to maximize or minimize, that's the equation that you're going to want to take the derivative of. And so in order to do that, we need to represent this equation in terms of one variable, either just x or just y. And so in order to do that, we're gonna use our secondary equation over here, which we call the constraint sometimes, that has our fixed value of 108, right? We know that the two numbers multiplied together or their product is going to be 108. That can't change. And so we're going to use this constraint or our secondary equation to get our primary equation in terms of one variable. And so we'll solve for either x or y in this case. It doesn't matter which one you pick, you'll still get the right answer in the end. But I'm going to choose to solve for x in this case. So we'll have that x is equal to 108 divided by y. And so then we can take this and substitute it in for x in our sum equation. So we'll have that s is equal to 108 divided by y plus 3y. And so then we now have our primary equation defined with one variable that we can now take the derivative of. But now before we do that, let's quickly ask ourselves what makes sense for values of y here? What would the domain be for the possible values of y in this scenario? And so if we think about it, if we have these two values, x and y, and we know their product is going to be 108, what is the smallest value that y could be? Well, we know from our problem that it has to be a positive number because it says find two positive numbers whose product is 108. And so we can completely rule out any negative values for y. And so I think it makes sense to start with zero and see what happens in this case. And so if you think about what happens if y is zero, you'd have zero times some value for x. And so no matter what, you're going to end up with zero. So zero is not going to work here. You cannot have zero as your value of y because your product is not going to be 108. But you could pick values larger than zero and that would be totally fine. So for our domain here, we'll have an open interval from zero to some greater value. And we have the open interval because it doesn't include zero, but it does include the values after zero. And so then what would be the largest value that y could be? And so if we go back to our equation here, we ask ourselves, how big could we make y such that y times some value of x is still 108? And if you think about it, you could actually pick larger and larger values of y and you'd still be able to pick a smaller value of x to still have a product of 108. So you could pick a number greater than 108. Let's say you picked 216. If you made x equal to 1 half, well then half of 216 would be 108. So 1 half times 216 would equal 108. And so you could keep picking higher values of y and then smaller values of x. And so actually there's no limit to what y could be in this case. And so we would say that our domain is from zero to infinity. We can continue to pick larger and larger values of y and get smaller and smaller fractional values for x and our product could still be 108. And so this is going to be the domain in this case. All right, so now that we have figured out what values of y make sense for this scenario, we can now take the derivative of our primary equation here. But before we do that, let's rewrite our equation like this. We'll have the s is equal to 108 times y to the negative first power. I just moved this to the numerator and gave it a negative exponent so that we can more easily see how to use our power rule. And then we'll just add 3y. All right, so now we can take our derivative. And if we do that, we'll have s prime is equal to negative 108 times y to the negative second power plus three, right? We multiply negative one times 108, 
subtracted one from our exponent to get negative two, and then the derivative of three y is just three. And so now what we wanna do is we wanna set our derivative equal to zero and solve for y in this case. And that's going to be one of the values that we're looking for here. So we'll have zero equal to negative 108 divided by y squared plus three, right? We just move this negative exponent back to the denominator so that it is positive. And then if we add this quantity to both sides, we will have that 108 divided by y squared is equal to three. And so then we can multiply both sides by y squared to have 108 is equal to three y squared. And then if we divide both sides by three, we'll have that 36 is equal to y squared and so then if we take the square root of both sides of our equation, we'll find that y is equal to plus or minus six. However, remember our domain, we are not including the negative values of y, right? We wanna find two positive numbers whose product is 108. And so in this case, we don't need that negative y value, so we're just gonna have that y equals positive six. And so now we found one of our values. And so now what we can do with this is plug it back into our constraint equation and solve for x to find what our value of x would be. And that will be our second number that we're looking for. And so if we do that, we'll find that x is equal to 108 divided by six. And 108 divided by six is going to be 18. So x is equal to 18. And so our answer is x equals 18 and y equals six. Let's look at one more final example. All right, so for our next example, we have that a rancher has 300 feet of fencing to use for enclosing two adjacent rectangular corrals. What dimensions should be used so that the enclosed area will be a maximum? And so then we are provided with a diagram with some pre-labeled sides, right? So we see that we have our vertical side labeled with a Y and these two horizontal edges labeled with X, right? Because these are two different corrals. We have two adjacent rectangular corrals and they're both going to have these same dimensions. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually also going to label these other sides because we already know what they are, right? If this side is y, then that means that this is going to be y and this is going to be y as well. They're all going to be equal because these are rectangular corrals. So we know that the opposite sides are going to be the same length. And so I'll label that in here. We'll have y and y and then we'll have x and x, right? All the opposite sides are going to be equal. And so then in this case, we want to maximize the area of these two corrals. We want the area to be the largest that it can be, given that we only have 300 feet of fencing to enclose them with. And so that's referring to the perimeter, right? If we only have 300 feet of fencing to put around the area here, that is referring to the perimeter or the measurement of the outside of our shapes, or more specifically, our rectangular corrals. And so let's write down our two equations. Let's start with the area equation, and then we'll write our perimeter equation. And so what would the area be for these two corrals? Well, we know it's gonna be the length times the width, which in this case is going to be two X, right? We have two X's, so two X times Y. That's going to be our area. So the area is equal to two X times Y. And so then this is going to be our primary equation. This is going to be the equation that we're going to be taking the derivative of once we get it in terms of one of these variables, right? Right now we have x and y, but ideally we either just wanna have x or we just wanna have y. And that's where the secondary equation or our equation dealing with the perimeter comes into play. And so our perimeter is going to be that 300 feet and that's going to be equal to what, right? We have to add all of these different sides up to figure out what the perimeter of these corrals would be. And so I see we have three sides labeled with Y, so I have three Y, and then we're gonna be adding the four sides labeled with X, so four X. And that's going to be the perimeter for our two pastures. And so now what we wanna do is we wanna solve for one of our variables here and then substitute it into our area equation so that we only have it in terms of one variable. And so I'm going to choose to solve for X in this case. So we're gonna be working in terms of Y. And so if we try to solve for X in this equation, I'll start by subtracting three Y from both sides. So we'll have 300 minus three Y is equal to four X. And then we'll divide both sides by four and that will give us that X is equal to 300 minus three Y divided by four. And so then we would want to substitute this in for X in our area equation. But before we do that, let's simplify this a little bit. We can make it a little bit nicer than it already is. If we divide 300 by four, we'll get 75. And then of course, three divided by four would be three fourths. And so we'd find that X is equal to 75 minus three 
fourths y. And so now let's substitute x with this in our area equation. And so we'll have that the area is equal to two times 75 minus three fourths y times y. And so then if we distribute two through this quantity and y through this quantity, we'll have that the area is equal to 150y minus 6 fourths y squared, right? Because two times 75 is 150, and then we multiply that y in there to have 150y, and then we multiply two times three fourths, which is six fourths, which we can reduce to three halves, and I'll do that then. And then we multiply this y in to get y squared. And so then I'll rewrite this as three halves because that's really what it reduces to. All right, so now we have a form of our area equation that is defined with just one variable, and so now we can take the derivative of it. But before we do that, let's ask ourselves, what values of y make sense for this scenario? What is the domain for the variable that we are solving for? And so if we look at our scenario here, what is the lowest possible value that y could be? Well, we know that y can't be a negative value, right? We can't have a negative measurement for one of the sides of our corrals. It just doesn't make sense. But what about zero? What if y was zero? What happens then? Well, if y was zero, that means there would not be any space between this side of the corrals and this side of the two corrals, right? And so if you imagine bringing these two sides in, you just have them right up next to each other and there really would be no area in there, right? You just have two fences right up next to each other, you couldn't fit anything in that corral, right? There is no cow skinny enough that will fit between those fences. It's not really an enclosed area, it's just two fences next to each other. So that's not going to be very helpful. And so in that case, zero is no good, but any value greater than zero, all of a sudden, you now have area. It may be small, like if you picked 0.1, I can't imagine how small that would be, but you would technically then have an area. And so in this case for our domain, we will have the open interval starting with zero. That means we're not including zero, but we are including values after zero. And so then what would be the largest value of y that we could have in this case? That might seem a little tricky to determine, but remember that we only have 300 feet of fencing to work with here. And so for sure, we can't have one side be 300 feet. That would be ridiculous. You would only have one edge of 300 feet of fencing, and then you would have none left for the rest of your corrals. So we can't pick a number that big. We can't pick 300. And so what would be the largest value we could pick? Well, we do have three sides of y, right? And so what if you were to divide that 300 feet evenly between the three sides? Well, you'd be using 100 feet for each side, and then you would have none left for your x's. And so this is kind of the reverse of what we looked at when y was equal to zero, because now x would be equal to zero because we're putting all the fencing into the sides labeled with y. And so each of these sides would be 100 feet, and then we'd be smashing them together, and we just have one long block of fencing. And so there'd be no space between those sides. And so just like when y was zero, and these two walls were smashed together, when x is zero, meaning that each y would be 100, these sides would be smashed together, and so then we would have no area. But if you pick a value for y that is less than 100, all of a sudden, you have some extra fencing now, albeit very small, left for these values of x. And so then you would have an area. And so what that means is that you can pick a value of y up to 100 feet. And so that would be the higher endpoint of our domain. All right, so now that we have determined what values of y make sense for this scenario, we can now take the derivative of our area equation and set it equal to zero and solve for y. And so in this case, we'll have a prime is equal to 150. That would be the derivative of 150y. It would just be 150. And then minus three halves times two times y. And so if we set this equal to zero, we'll have zero is equal to 150 and then minus, and this two and this two will cancel. And so we'll just have three y. And so then if we add three y to both sides, we'll have three y is equal to 150. And then if we divide both sides by three, we'll have that y is equal to 50. And so now we have our value of y. We know that each one of these sides should be 50 feet in length if we want to maximize this area. But we're not done because we wanna find our value for x as well. We only have half of our dimensions here. We have y, but we need x. And so we're gonna take this value of y and plug it into our constraint, or what we found x was equal to when we shifted around our perimeter equation. And so we'll have that x is equal to 75 minus 3 fourths times 50. And 3 fourths times 50 is equal to 75 halves, and so x equals 75 minus 75 halves. And so if you're taking 75 minus half of 75, then you're gonna be left with half of 75. 
And so x is equal to 75 halves, or you could say that x is equal to 37.5. And so then for our final answer, that means that y is equal to 50 and x is equal to 37.5, and those would both be in feet. And so those would be our dimensions and the final answer to this problem. And so that was the last example for this video. However, if you want to see one more example, I'll have a quick solve linked in the description below with another optimization problem if you want to see it. So I hope you'll check that out. All right, and so that's all I had for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. But if you don't, that's all I have for now. So I will see you next time.